Well, everyone, the current time is two o'clock central, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so glad that you're taking a little bit of time to be with us today. Um, this is Next Wave STEM's uh, remote webinar series. Um, today's topic is how to teach STEM remotely. And um, we're really excited to have each and every one of you with us. Uh, we've got lots of attendees today. We have a little bit of content to cover. So we make, we're we gonna make sure that we move. Um, but <laughs> we're also gonna have some design segments in that uh, we're gonna be asking for a little bit of feedback. Um, so basic uh, ground rules, house rules for today's webinar. Uh, we are in webinar mode. That means that we will not be able to see your faces. But as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the chat is open. The chat is open. The Q&A feature on Zoom is open. So if you have a question or a comment, you can just throw it in the chat or you can use the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, I'm really, really fortunate to have my colleague Sagundi. She is on the line monitoring our chat. So if I can't get to it in the chat, you are more than willing or more than uh, welcome to propose whatever question that you have for Sagundi. Um, she'll also be dropping in links to resources that I might be mentioning as uh, we're going on the fly. Um, another little bit of housekeeping for our attendees today is that if you are an educator in Illinois, um, we are offering PD credits for today's uh, webinar session, one hour. Um, you'll be receiving the information on how to redeem that in a follow-up email uh, following today. And if at any time you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, now <laughs> with all the boring stuff out of the way, um, we will press forward to the reason why we are on the call. But we want to begin um, at the beginning. That's usually a pretty good place to start. Uh, and talk a little bit more about Next Wave STEM and why it is we do what we do. Um, and really at its core, uh, Next Wave STEM is about generating uh, the problem solvers that we're going to need for the most pressing issues that our world is going to face. Um, we believe in innovation. We believe that young people are some of the most incredible innovators we will ever experience. Um, we believe that teachers are amazing innovators. And uh, we believe that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is an avenue, is a tool, is that giant lever that we can use to move the world. Um, teachers are critical to that, that uh, innovation that takes place. How can our children be the next scientists, engineers, and mathematicians if they don't have educators that are preparing them? So uh, we empower educators like you. Um, with our hands-on programs that are both in school, after school, um, but also now remote for uh, educators and school districts. Um, we are conducting programs K through 12 in robotics, drones, 3D printing, computers and AI, um, some really cutting edge emerging technologies. Um, not only because we're preparing a future generation, but because we know it's fun. Um, we are going to transform our children from just being consumers of technology to producers of technology. And we believe that many of our educators share that same goal. So we're really, really glad to have you with us. Uh, and now that I've introduced the company, I should take some time to introduce myself. I am Desmond Martin. I'm the program coordinator at Next Life STEM. Uh, and I'm also a curriculum writer. Uh, I work in writing curriculum for 3D printing, computers and robotics, um, AI, um, and uh, a couple other things that we have coming down the pipe as well. Um, my uh, formal training is in mechanical engineering and I've been working as an educator for the last 10 years. So I'm really happy to get into the weeds with any of you who have questions about our curriculum specifically or about uh, instruction with STEM remotely or in person or in any facet more generally. Um, I'm really, really excited to be with you all. So two main goals for today's webinar um, that we wanna share. 
and that's going to hopefully generate some really interesting dialogue back and forth about what we're doing in the classroom now that we've uh, all had to make a really, really dramatic shift. Um, the first thing we want to do is explore uh, effective instructional modeling. Um, and we're thinking about instructional modeling that deals with hands-on learning. Um, this is something that's a little bit tough to do now um, because for a lot of us, the bulk of what we use to teach STEM lived in our classroom. And um, we didn't have to think at all about what it meant to do that in spaces away from the classroom. Or if we did think about it, it was confined to the traditional science fair. Well, we are going to expand that thought process and think about effective ways for you to teach STEM and effective way for your students to learn STEM, even if they're removed from your presence for a little while. Um, the second thing we want to do is talk about what your options are in curricula and really compare and contrast distance learning and remote learning. Um, it's actually funny, the way we're going to move through our webinar today, these two agenda items are actually flipped. So I'll talk about distance learning and remote learning first, and then we'll talk about effective instructional modeling. And um, at the end, we're going to talk about more specific, really hard and fast ways that Next Wave STEM is going to be able to help you um, achieve your goals um, as we've all had to make some really big adjustments. So if you're as ready as I am, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So the first thing um, we have to understand is that if we want to know where we want to go, we have to understand where we've been. Um, this, that idea of location. Where have we been? What have we been doing? And how does that compare and contrast to what we want to do currently? So let's talk about traditional versus digital learning. And all of our educators here, we're very, very acquainted with traditional learning styles. Um, here in the US, we are used to being in school throughout the course of a school year um, that lasts about eight to 10 months. Um, it was that way really from a time where a country is more agrarian. Um, but <laughs> without getting into uh, really deep history here, uh, we know what traditional school looks like. We come into our buildings, we have schoolyard, we commute, um, we have our after school programs and activities um, that are scheduled and biased around the fact that our parents are, are providing childcare. Um, and that's a way to make sure that they're able to fulfill their obligations and still keep their kids engaged with things that are enriching them. Um, we're teaching live in front of our students and there are all kinds of messy, amazing, complicated, um, really eye-opening social and em emotional learning opportunities for our students, whether it's figuring out where they're going to sit in the classroom to navigating real, really difficult conflicts with administration, parents and teachers. And then we think about our goals as educators. Um, we're teaching to our standards. We have this idea of what will work from a content perspective and what's pedagogically important for our students to know as they matriculate whatever age or grade level they're matriculating. Um, and we're doing that because we want them to be able to go out and get jobs. We want them to be vocationally ready or move them to the next level of education, whether that's secondary or tertiary. And then we're building a holistic student, things that we think about in 21st century skills. Now, the interesting thing is that while we're very familiar with the traditional model, um, the digital models share some things in common. Um, the location, of course, changes. For the last two months, it's been home offices. It's been the dining room table or the bedroom or the sitting room or in front of the TV or the large computer or <laughs> literally wherever you might be able to find some space. Um, the learning style is blended. Um, something that a lot of our students might not have ever experienced until they got to the tertiary level of education, um, where there's this mix of in-person um, engagement and screen time. Um, for a lot of our students, it's almost exclusively screen time working through video conferencing tools. Um, but then you're also getting your learning management system more involved. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But the interesting thing is that our goals are kind of still in the air. We're assuming that they're going to be, for the most part, the same 
as when we were doing our traditional learning because those goals are worthy goals. We want to make sure that our students are learning what they need to know. Um, the standards aren't getting thrown out of the window. How we assess them may change. Um, the way that we're held accountable may change. That depends on what state that you're in. Um, that depends on um, a lot of the things that are still being worked out in the middle of this crisis and the pandemic and things that we might not know definitively for maybe even a couple of years. Um, but we do know that we're teaching our children because we want to give them skills so that they can go and get good jobs and that they can be holistic learners, holistic students, and holistic peoples. Um, at the end of the day, those goals fundamentally stay the same. Um, so for us, it's just making the adjustments that we need to make to reach those goals, um, whether we're teaching um, literature, whether we're teaching arts, or in this case, whether we're teaching STEM subject matter. So we have to start someplace. And there's that big question of where do we start? Well, the first thing is to think about what our learning objectives are. Why are we teaching our students STEM? Um, if we were teaching STEM before specifically, um, what were we doing? Was it coding classes? Was it the science fair? Was it a more traditional science curricula? Were there any emerging technologies involved? Um, and what were we trying to get out of those experiences? Um, a lot of you have already been doing this with your administrators and your educators. In fact, all of you, I'm certain of it, have been. You've been collaborating each and every day. Um, and you've been working with all the teachers that were in your building, thinking about your instructional models, thinking about your learning goals, thinking about the ways that you can support each other. Um, you're finding ways to build continuity with your students, making it easier for your students to adapt to online learning, but also finding ways to be creative. So you're already doing this work. You've been doing this work for a while now. We want to continue to augment that. And of course, our goals are still what we have top of mind. 4C learning skills, the more flexible life skills, and those things that we know are critical traits when we think about next generation science standards. So now that we know the why, now that we have the baseline, we see where we, we, where we have been and we get a sense of where we wanna go, we wanna really be in, be diligent and be intentional about thinking about the differences between remote learning and distance learning and what we can take from both of those approaches. Um, some of us, those words may not mean hardly anything. And if that's the case, that's completely fine. Um, but we want to define these things because they really represent two um, really important paradigms when we think about digital education e-teaching. They're very different, but they're things that we can take to build an effective instructional model in STEM for our students. So we have distance learning and then we have remote learning. Distance learning is really prioritizing that blended learning style. Um, that means that we're going to have a few different ways of going through our learning modalities. It's not just going to be all screen time. It's not just going to be all worksheets. It's not just going to be all reading assignments. It's not going to be just one or even two of anything. There are going to be a mixtures of ways that we go about um, learning as we learn. In this way, there are lots of elements to distance learning and project-based learning that are similar. Um, we're going to get physical, hands-on with our technology as much as we possibly can. We'll talk about what the differences look like in our different situations a little bit later on. Um, distance learning is amazing because it leverages your whole class as a, as a resource. Um, for our students who are middle school and older, who have the ability to um, communicate with each other digitally, um, many of them are digital, not many, all of them, our digital natives, um, they are going to have the ability now to share with each other and communicate with each other as not necessarily though they were directly in class, but in ways that help to augment that learning. Um, distance learning is amazing because it's going to prepare us for future disruptions. Um, 
God forbid that there are more and more global crises that keep our students from physical classrooms, but it's completely possible. Um, Next Wave STEM, we're based here in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, snow days are a real thing. Um, and so we're going to be ready for in the future for if we face situations that um, cause disruptions. Um, and digital learning is really amazing because it allows for easier differentiation for students moving at different speeds, at different skill levels, at different educational tracks. Um, distance learning um, may be applicable for students who are working in a Montessori context. Um, we are big, big fans of distance learning and next wave STEM. Um, we contrast that with remote learning, um, which is more focused on the ability of the student to go at their own pace and then be self-driven learners. Um, this may work really, really well for our older students who are a little bit more cognitively developed. Um, remote learning is also very, very friendly with our learning management systems. Those of us who are assigning um, our assignments, making our assignments and sharing them via Google Classroom or Moodle or Schoology or whatever your LMS might be. Um, back in the day, it was PowerSchool. Um, our LMSs were almost designed exactly for the situation. Our students are able to check in digitally and really remove some of those sticking points, some of the friction that we saw um, when it comes to interacting in the classroom. Um, Remote learning also allows us to do individualized feedback and lesson tailoring. Um, that's something that works really, really small for a, well for a smaller class size or um, even individualized instruction if you're going to with a one-to-one -one model. Um, very, very rare, but uh, provides that opportunity and is also based um, in a situation for future disruptions. So we've got these two kind of paradigms of thinking here. We've got hands-on and blended learning where there's a lot more interaction between um, students and educators um, with distance learning. Um, we have some differentiation that's going on as well. And then we have remote learning where it's more about the individual being self-driven and really being able to check in digitally through the primary digital tool that you're using. So kind of holding those two thoughts in mind here, um, you may be working more with one, you may be working more with another, you've got this kind of dance that you're doing to figure out which works best. I want to pause for a second and, and pose a question. And this is where we get our first opportunity to give some feedback in the chat. I want you to identify one opportunity you've uh, seen as you're um, focusing on teaching at distance. Um, what's one thing that you see as being a pro? Um, what's one thing that you can see as being improved upon? Um, what's something that you want to try that you now can try as an educator? Um, and even if it doesn't have to deal with an being an educator directly in the classroom, maybe you're just getting a little bit more rest or you're learning more about um, managing students' social emotional learning. Um, what's that silver lining thing that you're excited about integrating into your education? And um, I will be silent for about a minute while we get some responses. We have uh, Mrs. Satawi from Saudi Arabia. Hello, thank you so much for joining us and playing up with that time change once again. She says that she's excited to differentiate more. Um, that's something that can be a challenge and is really time consuming. Um, really excited to figure out how we do more than that, more of that in the classroom. Shannon says that she's struggling um, to figure out um, what these should be, how the students should work independently. That's, that's a really interesting um, challenge that we're having on 
figuring out what should be independent learning, what's group learning, what's live instruction, what is even pre-recorded instruction. Um, it's kind of hard because we sometimes don't know the answer until we assess. So we can definitely uh, commiserate with that. Ha, ah, pro from Sarah, one-to-one -one work and feedback given to the students. Yes, um, it is oftentimes much easier for us to do that individualized feedback. Um, it's easier, it may be a little bit different with respect to the time consumptive nature of it, but if we're able to adjust our workflows a little bit, it may be possible for us to give some really positive timely feedback to our students and not uh, <laughs> be working 18 hours a day to do it. Ah, Mark, hey, students don't need physical transportation to get to class. Um, the home has become the classroom. There are educators who have been for many, many years um, figuring out ways to turn the home and the world around them into their classroom. The idea that the classroom lives underneath the place that we live and is the entire world, the one world, one room classroom. Um, that's really exciting to see our students think about um, learning holistically, not being just something that they do when they go into a building. Ah, oh, Christine says that students have been able to work on projects more. Uh, Project-based learning is amazing, can be difficult sometimes to execute if we don't understand it or even if we run into challenges with our students who aren't used to that uh, methodology. Um, but working on more projects even if their ability to travel physically um, is limited, amazing opportunities. Uh, Mary says that she's learning how to create digital lessons. Um, it's hard to, and you're right, Mary, it is hard to get students engaged at distance, um, but figuring out the way to create a digital lesson and then learning about the different levers, the different activities, the different tools that we might have available to us to keep students engaged, um, going to be really important. Um, that's, I think, where that hands-on physicality comes in, just switching up learning modalities. Oh, Sarah with a really good one, equal access to technology and preparing students for distance. Um, we just heard um, here in Illinois that there's going to be um, some specific allocated time with regards to professional development um, for teachers specifically for that purpose of increasing your skill at teaching distance and, and even increase some time to bridge some of those divides when it comes to um, access to learning technology. Um, that's going to be key and critical. Cynthia says that she's confused on how students will have the material to work on their own as K through fifth graders. Um, really good point. Um, some of those challenges are difficult to overcome, but um, the interesting thing is that um, there are some creative ways that we can think about household objects that let them explore STEM. So um, we're hoping that even with difficult circumstances, um, students can take advantage of what they do have to increase that learning. Um, great, great responses. And um, more than anything, really hopeful because um, it really confirms that our educators are doing what you've always done, um, which is problem solving. Um, I stand in solidarity with you as we continue to problem solve and help you problem solve. Uh, we're problem solving together. So this is the part where I would encourage us to take um, the best of both approaches when we think about remote learning and distance learning. Um, physical equipment resources um, to differentiate modalities is going to be a big deal, um, especially in STEM. Right now, what we've seen are our students working almost exclusively digitally with respect to distance learning. Um, and that means looking at their computer screen, um, submitting assignments digitally on their computer screen. Um, very, very rarely are students getting hands on with a tool for learning that's not their computer right now. Um, those rare situations that we've seen are in large respects um, performance tasks. We've seen students who, if they're studying a musical instrument and they're fortunate 
to have that instrument at home or have their home on home instrument, they're able to do individualized or even small group um, practice and small group learning on that instrument. In that same way, we can think about our physical tools and resources as instruments as well, even if they're just um, fundamentally different than the modalities in which they've been learning um, before. Um, as long as they're doing something different than watching a video, reading a text, or typing text, then we can think about differentiating the parts of our students' brains that are working, even if they're still working on a device. Um, we want just not screen time, but for that time to be interactive. Um, the second thing we can do is to integrate your LMS. Um, a few of you said that you're going in your own technical skills and capacity. That's going to be key. Um, and it's stretching us, it's pulling us, um, it's twisting us and what we've done traditionally and in our workflows. It's engaging different parts of our brain. Um, I'm really excited about teaching um, teachers about next wave STEM generally um, and about emerging technologies generally because about 90% of the time we're working with a tool, a type of technology that our, our educators have never used before. Um, so as excited as I am to teach new things, um, I'm excited to for our, our teachers to learn new things. Um, on top of that, we've got this completely new paradigm shift with um, what we have to manage and think about teaching our students because of the tools that we're using. If we're thinking about our students engaging in a digital classroom, um, we can kind of draw parallels to the ways that they would engage um, in a real world classroom. You've got your rules and your boundaries about how you behave as citizens in your classrooms. You've got issues of etiquette. You've got issues of communication, whether or not you're gonna be able to raise your hand or when hand raising to get feedback in and out is not allowed. Um, you've got rules about how to leave and exit the classroom. You've got rules about how you will communicate both critically and non-critically in your classroom. Um, a lot of those same skills um, don't necessarily carry over one-to-one -one in the digital space, especially if your students are a little bit older as digital natives and they're very used to communicating differently digitally than they would in the real world. So now we have this opportunity to talk about how to be a better digital citizen. Um, because these worlds are now fused together, we're now able to, to speak to our, our students about how to effectively communicate by email via a video call. Uh, how, for lack of a better word, not to be a jerk <laughs> in, in the chat. Um, that's gonna be really critical, especially for those situations where you're not doing monitoring. Um, small group video chat, small group text chat. Those are things that we want to be able to give our students autonomy in as they're driving learning forward. Um, that's another opportunity that we're gonna be able to engage. And a lot of people also said differentiation, exploring new methods and technologies for teaching new tools. Um, some of us are now Zoom masters, um, even though Zoom has, has had its struggles with security. Um, and we're able to take that increased technical knowledge and skill for us and connect that to real world applications that matter for the students. Um, we already know for those of us who have ever taught any kind of high school mathematics before, that our students will say to us and are oftentimes right, uh, hey, when am I ever gonna use this? We can kind of break that mold and make those real world connections for our students. So we're gonna take bits and pieces. We're gonna take those things that are really good about distance learning. We're gonna take those things that are really good about remote learning and we're gonna stick them right together. Okay, so now that we've talked about distance versus um, remote learning more generally, now we can get into like the nitty gritty good stuff. Um, what are some tangible real ways that you can teach STEM remotely? What are the instructional approaches? What are the methodologies? What are our tangible practical things that we can do? Well, we lay it out and first off, three main points that I'm gonna expound on as we go. And um, 
one thing I should also mention, I didn't tell you this about myself before, but I am excitable. <laughs> and when I get excited, I can tend to accelerate my speech a little bit. If I'm going too fast or you want me to back it up or you just need me to slow down, shout it out in the chat and I'll see that and I can go back and cover something again. It's not a huge amount, but I can talk and talk and go and go. So this idea of taking the beauty of hands-on STEM, if you were building a robot in your classroom, if you were flying a drone in your classroom, if you were 3D printing in your classroom and doing 3D design and post-processing and manufacturing, um, we want to take the beauty of that hands-on experience and bring it to the online space. And we found that there are three key things that help to do that. We want to encourage discussion. We want to use every day materials to make and show our lesson where where possible and then we want to do live demonstration and instruction or and and or <laughs> augment that with third-party videos we want to build on the other resources that are available to us so if our students are visual learners they have reference to go back to um, for some of us, that's going to involve even making our own pre-recorded instruction. Uh, another different methodology for us as educators that may be quick or may be really, really robust depending on um, how invested you are. Pre, so as we think about the different ways to throw these things together into a cohesive lesson, we can also think about them in lesson phases three particular lesson phases that are gonna be really, really powerful for us to use. Um, the first that we can think about is our pre-lesson. Um, and we can think about that from the perspective of the discussion, um, the actual equipment, the hands-on component equipment and materials, and then also our digital instruction and or lessons we may have available to us. Um, for our students in emerging technology courses, um, all of our courses at Next Wave STEM, they're also digital. They are using an application on a device, on a computer, on their cell phone, but they're not walled off. They're things that our students can get hands on with and experiment with and jump into and explore anytime that we're not there with them as instructors. Um, we encourage play. Um, we think that students um, that play with their tools actually become much, much better at using their tools. So before a lesson ever gets started, if they're building the robot, let's say that they're using our remote learning course where we actually ship robots to the students. Open the robot, play with the parts, try to put it together. I guarantee you if your students get one of our robots and try to put it together by themselves, 95% chance they're going to put that thing together incorrectly, but that's fine because that is actually going to accelerate our, le our learning a little bit um, later on the line in the course. Um, students can learn about the methodologies when it comes to flying drones. They can get adjusted to flying the drones indoors or outdoors. Um, they can play around with computer aided design software that's free. Um, that's valuable, valuable time for our students to be able to actually engage the equipment. If they know that they're going to be in STEM class at one o'clock on Friday, but they've received their equipment on Tuesday, I'm hoping that they know all kinds of things about that equipment before we ever get started with the equipment. So as an example, as a a tangible example that you can take away for something that your students can get familiar with right now today. Um, some of you may be familiar with Tinkercad. I've talked about it before um, at some length in our previous webinars. Um, Tinkercad is an object design resource library, but also a really, really robust um, digital um, design uh, software. Um, Christine says that her kids love it. Um, Tinkercad is always adding resources in terms of equipment and material and something that they've done in direct response to the COVID-19 crisis is actually upload examples of everyday objects that students might have at home. Um, this creates 
a two-pronged effect here when we think about physical learning and designing some of our science demonstrations or some of our other STEM activities. If students have tissue rolls or, or paper towel rolls and they have access to pencils and pennies or toothpicks or straws or a, a, a plethora of other household items, they can actually use those items and design their structures or their demonstrations right in Tinkercad. We're, we're killing two birds with one stone. We're going to learn design skills and build those design skills for our students, but we're also going to be structuring our physical objects that they have in the home to try first. Um, listed on the right hand side, you have actually a clickable link to Tinkercad. Um, I'm going to be sending out this slide deck to all of our participants today after um, the webinar and you'll be able to click through Tinkercad so that you can go here. But you also have access to Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, Instructables. Those are websites that will allow you to have access to other 3D printed files. So our students are able to access these resources for free. Um, we want to give them those things that are digital, but also relate to the physical. So for our, our participant who says, uh, how are we gonna be able to gauge the K through five with the materials? Well, we have to think outside the box a little bit and access the digital and the physical materials. If they don't have everything that you even see on this screen digitally, I'm willing to bet that they might have a few objects. And even if they don't have those objects, that's okay. Tinkercad allows them to work with it in the digital space, if not the physical space. The second thing that we wanna do when we think about our lesson design is in the actual middle of the lesson instruction. Um, this is the part that I'm willing to bet that a lot of you have gotten <laughs> really, really good at in the past month or so. Um, whether you're preferred uh, actual video tool is what we're using now, Zoom, or you're using Google Meet, or you're using Skype, or whatever your tool is, um, you're going to have to learn the ins and outs and the support for that. Um, and it's going to be difficult for some of our students. I'm not going to lie to you at all. Um, those places where there is the digital divide where students don't have the devices or don't have access to stable high-speed internet in order to access the live instruction, that can be a challenge, but that also presents an opportunity um, where COPA is permitting for us to actually record our instruction and make that available for students later on. Um, I'm expecting almost every teacher in every school that's um, Google compatible that's gone to G Suite and Google Classroom, but there are gonna be all kinds of YouTube videos and YouTube playlists that you created of your instruction for students to refer back to as a part of blending the distance learning and remote learning methodology. Um, and then you also, many of you once again are already doing this, engaging your students with third party videos coming from sites like YouTube and Vimeo. Um, I'm also believing that there, there are gonna be a lot more content providers who are making those resources available. Um, really, really important for those visual learners. Um, one thing that Next Wave STEM is going to be encouraging our teachers and that we're going to be continue, continuing to support you with regards to resources and digital teaching and digital learning when you access our curricula is to think about support for your actual tool. Um, some of us have struggled to figure out how to change the configuration or mute everyone or make the whiteboard accessible. Um, learn the tool. Um, I'll say it again twice, learn the tool, learn the tool. Um, the ability for you to share your digital screen, if you're doing design, for example, or if you're dragging and dropping block code, or if you're working with the physical robot as you're building it, um, the ability for you to share your screen or share your camera and for your students to do the same so that they're just not watching you, but they're actually showing the work that they're doing to you and to the entire class completely changes the dynamic. Um, it, your students are going to tune out. I <laughs> will tune out uh, if the only thing that they're able to do is to watch and listen 
and there's not those feedback events, there's not the opportunity. So we're places where you have digital whiteboards, we're places where you can do even live polling and answering questions. Um, some of us have the quiz clickers that universities are like scamming the money out of us on in college. Um, any tool where you can engage your students um, to be looking but also sharing information is going to be really, really critical. And third, we think about the way that we assess, even if we're not formally assessing, just getting feedback from our students and our parents. Um, that's something that we don't think about oftentimes, but for our parents who have changes in their work schedules, some of them are being able to work from home, some of them still have to go and work physically away from the home, but a, a good amount of our parents are also learners with our students are also tuned in and trying to help provide a social situation and social setting um, where their students feel like they're supported as they're learning. Um, we want to create an opportunity for them to give us direct feedback and for us to give them direct feedback. Um, it may be an immediate 30 second form that students fill out at the end of the class as an exit ticket. It may be three minutes. It may be a quiz and take 10 minutes. Um, it's something that you get to decide based on the content area, the age of your students, and your parent engagement. Um, that's going to be able to give us a little bit more direct feedback about what our students are taking away from the class and even more what our students are able to retain. Once again, lots of you already know how to do this and are doing it well if you're assigning um, things on Google Classroom or in Moodle. Um, really, really powerful there that we continue to engage that as an instructional practice. So that's really the key stuff there. You want to get as hands on as you can and create those engagement events as you're continuing to grow in the tool. But not only that, creating, creating like actual hands on things for your students to do that aren't watching the screen engaging with text or typing text. That's where our programs that involve block coding come in, cut that involve digital design come in when we think about robotics, coding with drones, and 3D printing. So this is the part where I talk about how NextWave STEM can really help you gather from the fact that we're engaging this instructional model that we really believe that being hands-on at distance is super, super critical. What can we do for you next? Um, how can we empower your classroom? Well, the first thing is what you're doing currently. For the summer, from this very moment and going until the week of July 4th and probably into the foreseeable future, we are gonna be running these free PD sessions um, for our educators that are in Illinois. Um, now, we've been hearing some of you who are multiple attendees for Next Way STEM sessions. Um, we are also exploring ways to make PD credit hours, um, depending on what your state's requirements are, um, available in other states. We're working on that to get that to you. But everybody's going to get a certificate. So if your administrator needs to see that you're attending professional development, you're going to have the information that's going to help verify that for you. Currently, there are Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we're doing repeat material. So if there's a Tuesday that you can't make, um, then the following Tuesday may be the same subject matter. The same thing for the Thursday sessions. If you can't make it on Thursday, um, then following Thursday may be the same, same subject material. But if you just can't make it, you can't get the PD, don't worry, we are saving everything on YouTube. Um, I'm sending out emails. We're gonna be letting you know whether you can make the session or not. We're gonna be sending you the link to that so you can see that. Um, there's a playlist for all of our PD sessions that you, should, you would also be able to access. So we wanna make sure that you have access to those materials. Um, in fact, I'm looking at our calendar that's posted up here. Our next course, um, or our next PD session deals with teaching 3D printing remotely where I get like specifically into the weeds with 3D printing and computer aided design. I'm really excited to do that session. But continue to engage us 
um, will be here for quite some time. For our schools and our parents, Next Wave STEM has offered a new, uh, a, well, a new option for the way that we're providing our instruction. Um, traditionally, it will be in school where we're licensing the curriculum, you can buy our curriculum. Um, but what we're offering now is actually distance learning. Um, what you're able to do at Next Wave STEM is access our courses computers, um, well not computers, but actually coding with drones, um, intro to robotics, and intro to 3D printing. We have created courses where we have our instructors. Our instructors do live instruction and assessment with students. We are also making these courses available for just parents who want to engage students. Um, we know some schools have differences in bandwidth, differences in capacity. Um, we want your students to be able to engage with STEM learning. So maybe you're not able to do that instruction yourself. Reach out to us and we can help augment your students' um, learning as well. Um, and those are situations where your students don't need the equipment. If they don't have the equipment, if they don't have a drone, if they don't have the robot, if they don't have a 3D printer, we can get them that 3D printer. We have no problem nailing them the equipment that we use so they can get hands on with it. But if they don't want the equipment, if they don't have the space for it, don't have the capacity for it, not a problem at all. All of our courses, we have a, all of our courses are also be, being designed and are currently designed in such a way where you can run them without equipment as well. They're hands on, they're changing learning methodologies so that students can continue to really be creative and engaged as they're learning STEM um, throughout the rest of the school year. It's going to be super important for us to think about what our future is going to be. So at Next Wave STEM, we're going to continue to build on our options for remote learning so that students, so that teachers have different options because everything is still very much in flux. Um, don't worry, we do not plan to disappear on you. Um, we're gonna be here to continue to augment that instruction. So I want to pause for a moment because um, there may be questions that you have about anything that we're doing at Next Wave STEM. Uh, I see here that uh, one of our attendees said that they didn't receive a certificate last week. Don't worry. Um, if you need the certificate, if you need an actual piece of paper that says your name and that you've been here, we can draft that for you. What we've been sending out for all of our participants is the certificate form for Illinois. Um, all you need to do is put your name and the date on there. We'll make sure will ensure that all of your information is update for Illinois educators. Um, but I do want to uh, quiet myself and open up the lines for all of you. So if you've got any questions, uh, use the Q&A function, use the chat. Um, my colleagues, Sagundi and I are here. Um, what are your burning questions? Oh, really great question from, from Mark, who says that he works at a mission-driven STEM nonprofit in the Northeast. Um, thanks so much, Mark. I know that time difference is slight, but any time difference, we appreciate you making that adjustment for. 
Um, have you found any resources that are especially helpful for curriculum building and next wave STEM? Um, yes. And the resource that I find myself engaging time and time again is a resource that I, I'm sure that you're also familiar with, um, is with respect to Instructables. Um, for those of us who are not familiar with Instructables, it is a free com uh, repository of instructions and lessons and even courses um, for the maker community. Um, it focuses on all kinds of skills and crafts, whether it's physical creation, things like furniture making, to cooking, to more digital-based skills, robotics, coding with open source of small computers like Arduino and Raspberry Pi, 3D printing. Um, it lives underneath the Autodesk umbrella, and I'm constantly engaged in that community to see the different project ideas that people are coming up with and trying to build those connections to emerging technologies that we want to focus on. Um, Next Wave STEM, we are a little coding bias, um, but we're coding bias with this idea of not just working specifically on digital um, applications, but on physical applications. Um, that's why our coding is coding a physical robot. It's coding to make a drone fly autonomously. Um, something that we want to build in the future is coding um, to do um, digital design and 3D printing via code. Um, with all that being said, um, I'm pulling ideas from the makerspace constantly. Instructables is my go-to for that. Uh, Joyce says that she is new to STEM and feeling a little bit overwhelmed. What do you recommend? Um, honestly, for those of us who are brand new to STEM, Tinkercad. Um, Tinkercad is a great place to start because it integrates so many skills. Um, you're learning digital design. You're learning um, a little bit more about the um, really fine ways that we move between the digital, digital space and preparing an object to interact with a machine when we're thinking about a 3D printer. And from there, you may not never do 3D printing or you may take a step that next little step that feels like a big step, but it just sends you down this amazing rabbit hole of getting a 3D printer in your classroom or working with a small 3D printer yourself or working with a small 3D printing company to actually print objects. Um, digital design problem solving is a great place to start in STEM. Um, so Syncrocad is really good um, because you're building in spatial recognition, math, um, computer science, when you think about coding and languages, uh, I could go on and on and on. Um, <laughs> start with Tinkercad. Uh, let's see. Sarah says she's a teacher who's new at coding. Where should you start? Code.org. Uh, amazing resource for beginner coders of all ages. Um, Lots of their resources are currently being used in multiple school districts throughout the United States. Code.org is a great place to start. Um, also, a couple of resources that I mentioned in our last webinar, uh, Code Pen, P -E -N, uh, Free Code Camp are also um, really useful sites to learn coding. Um, lots of resources available there. And um, for those of us who are familiar with math instruction, uh, math supplementation through Khan Academy, Khan Academy also does some basic coding as well. Uh, definitely recommend you checking out those resources. Really, really good question. A lot of us are not digital, are native digital coders. I certainly am not. I did not learn to code until I got to college. So um, it, can, it can feel like a difficult first step to take, but it really is like learning a new language. Um, so some of us, uh, speak English and a little bit of French and HTML and Java. We can continue to build up those language skill sets as well. Really good question so far. Are there any other questions?
Uh, got a question about certificates. Yes, uh, we'll make sure that those certificates get out to you. Um, we'll <laughs> put your name on, on there for you so that you're good to go. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Atawi, you're asking about you and your colleague. We'll take care of you. Oh, Sugandi asked a really great question. What's the most important thing someone new to online teaching should keep in mind? Um, the way that I would answer that question, if you are brand new to online teaching, you do not have to be perfect. Um, it's going to freak you out to stand in front of a computer screen and um, be wondering whether or not your students are getting it. Um, the best thing that you can do, and I promise you there's nothing wrong with it, is to check in with your students. Hey, are you with me? Do you see my screen? Uh, can you hear me? Um, do you understand what I'm talking about? See how they're doing. Engage with them. How was your day? How do you feel? Um, even go as far as to slow yourself down and give them opportunities to share and to teach with you as well. Um, especially when we think about the STEM space, um, if this is something that's new to you, you're a first time STEM teacher or you've never worked with the technology before, and there might be a student who is really, really good at um, the technology that you're working with, especially in 3D printing, printing um, open up their ability to share their screen and to push your class forward. Um, you're going to be learning together, so you can really grow in that way. Uh, we got a couple of other questions. Uh, what do you feel is the best way to provide PD remotely to new teachers who are expected to teach STEM in the fall? Oh, that's a that's a million dollar question that we got there uh, from <laughs> Susanna. Uh, the best way to provide PD remotely um, is actually something that I would love to engage in the future is to form that relationship with your provider so that you can also be hands on. Um, the webinar is good because it's giving opportunity for people from a wide swath to capture. Um, what's even better, and that's something that you can come to Next Wave STEM for as well, um, is how can we get some face time with you, get some technology in front of us, digging through our curriculum and really trudge through those weeds. Um, it's, it's a little weird because their technology concerns that you have to go through, sharing the screen, sharing the camera, um, making sure that you're on the same page. I can't physically be there in the classroom with you, but we can walk with you together. A really, really great question. Uh, Jen says that she joined and is wondering if it's possible to get a copy. Yes, Jen, you will be receiving a copy of the recording for this presentation, and you will also be receiving a copy of the slide deck. So don't worry, we got you covered. This is awesome. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> you guys are amazing participants. I'm just clearing my question queue. And as Sagani just put into the chat, um, we are more than willing to continue to work with your school district and with your new teachers to get your, to get your, um, your staff acclimated to your current STEM program or the STEM program that you're working with from Next Wave STEM. And of course, if you want any more information, if you need us to answer more questions, We'd love for you to reach out to us. Um, up in the corner of your screen, some places my face in color, uh, that's my face in black and white. And that's my email underneath my face. Uh, reach out to me. You can email me at any time. I am pretty good about responding to those emails um, no later than about a day. And uh, Next Wave STEM is active on social media. We are on Twitter, we are on LinkedIn, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. Um, we have not graduated to TikTok um, one day, maybe, um, but I won't be TikToking, I think. 
I'm not that uh, that physically coordinated. Um, and my colleague Gundy, our school partnerships manager, she has also dropped her email address in there as well. So if you're looking to form a partnership, if you're looking to acquire a curriculum or get teacher training, um, she's the one to reach out there. Or if you email me, I'll point you in her direction. Well, that is three o'clock, everybody. Uh, I hope today's webinar was helpful. It's really something that I am so excited for. Uh, there's so many opportunities. There's so many really, really robust challenges that we're dealing with right now. Um, but we love and appreciate you. And we really do mean love and appreciate you for um, rising to that challenge. Um, not because you have to, not because you're obligated, but because you love your students. Um, continue to love your students, continue to be gentle with yourselves. Um, we're going to get through this together. Um, so until the next time I see you all, um, have an amazing day. And um, if you've got any questions, don't be a stranger. Reach out and we'll get right back to you. Uh, thanks so much, and we will see you on the next webinar, which is Thursday at 2 o'clock. Bye-bye, everybody.